All right, so this is the second video lecture on the topic of parenting. Um, these next two slides really are about the transition, and often these are things that, you know, we think about the pregnancy and we think about having the kids, but there is this um, significant period between, uh, between pregnancy and sort of settling into a routine. And there are different uh, experiences for women, obviously the person that's, that's given birth, than there are for fathers. So this slide is about transitions for women and some of the things that, you know, if you have babies, you're familiar with. Um, but for folks that haven't had babies, um, we don't, these aren't necessarily the things that we talk about, right? So there's this term for the transition to motherhood, the mat mm, that, that would be like adolescence, matraescence, right? And it's the assumption is, is that we will automatically be bonded to our children and that for some people, fortunately that happens, um, but for some women, it really doesn't happen. They don't feel that natural automatic bond. And this can be really traumatic and it can make women feel guilty because they don't feel like they just fell in love with their baby be like they have read about or they have heard about. And part of that falling in love phenomena is related to a chemical known a uh, hormone, hormone um, neurotransmitter known as oxytocin. So fortunately, um, for the for women who have high levels of oxytocin, they do feel this bond, but there's a lot of reasons, right? Lots of things can complicate uh, childbirth and delivery um, and induction when the body has not decided it's time to deliver, C-section, complications, pre-existing mental health issues. There's lots of things that can interfere with that natural, biological, emotional attachment that our culture has told us is supposed to happen. And if it doesn't happen, that's there's something wrong with you. And that's what we call mom shaming. Mom shaming is what? You didn't have a natural home water birth or you you didn't breastfeed? Don't you know breastfeeding is better? Or you're using bottles? You know, all of those sort of judgments that come when a woman makes choices uh, that some other woman decides is not sort of appropriate. So what you have, well, I'll get to that in just a second. This is why, so I was, as what I was sort of hinting at before, the conspiracy of silence. I believe that's a quiz question. What is the conspiracy of silence? Well, that is about the emotional anguish and the depression and the sadness and the the difficulties after the baby comes because again our culture tells us oh this is a wonderful magical time and for some women it is but for a lot of women this is a very hard time and you see over here in this little box all so many of the things that can happen just to a woman's body in relationship to you know to childbirth you know crying and hemorrhoids and constipation and lots of bleeding and hair loss and it can be a very I remember when my first child was born, <laughs> I had my mom bring up the pants, the jeans that I wore before I had gotten pregnant. You know, I thought for sure that once that baby came, I could fit into my pre pre baby clothes. And for a lot of women, what's it, that's what it says right there. They still look pregnant, right? And that can be kind of depressing, um, especially if we don't talk about it. So that's what this is about, right? We want to diminish the conspiracy of silence. And then um, there are different degrees of this emotional, depressive sort of adjustment, right? You can, you, we, we, the baby blues is just this sort of, uh, and, and a lot of this has to do with this sudden drop of hormones that changes postpartum, right? And so you have the baby blues, which are sort of a mild version. Then you can get to postpartum depression, uh, which is a more profound, um, longer term, experience of, well, of depression. There's also a phenomena called peripartum, and I was not familiar with this one, peripartum depression. And this is a kind of depression that happens before delivery. But the worst one, or the uh, worst, yeah, the most profound one is this postpartum psychosis. And psychosis is a fancy word for like a, a snap from reality, right? But for some women, not very many, fortunately, this can be so bad that they can't take care of their children. What's the name of that woman um, who drowned her six kids? Uh, you probably know she was, um, yeah, she's currently incarcerated, but the doctors had told her she shouldn't have any more babies after like the number five because her postpartum depression was so profound. But after the sixth one came, she experienced such such 
uh, profound postpartum psychosis that she drowned her children one at a time and laid them all up on the bed. Uh, I was right there on the tip of my So there are laws, and I believe this is a quiz question too, that seek to protect babies or keep them safe um, in the event that a woman experiences this postpartum psychosis and depression, and those are safe haven laws, safe havens and baby Moses laws. And what these are, 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 uh, are laws that allow, and I think different states have different age limits, but they allow um, babies to be dropped off, usually at a fire station or an emergency room, um, with no questions asked, assuming the baby is safe, right, and you haven't, like, put it in a cardboard box or something, but you can drop your baby off, no questions asked, and you will not be charged with abandonment. Now, there is a, there's an age limit usually. I want to say like some places maybe it's 60 days, um, and there are limits as to where are safe places, and I think they almost all include a fire station and an emergency room, but those are safe haven laws, um, and each, again, each state varies by, okay, there's also by age. There's also transitions for dads, right? Despite the fact, well, mom's body is changing, but this like babies radically change the way dad's lives were organized too. And one of the things you often hear is that dads feel like forgotten because, you know, baby comes, mom gets gifts, baby gets gifts. What about dad, right? All of a sudden, especially for first children, right? For first babies, because, you know, the, the, it was a couple, and now it's a family. It was uh, it was two, and now you have like this third wheel. So you shift. One of the shifts is you to go from a couple to a family. And some of the things that predict how well this transition is going to go, right, is what's up here, this role of the gatekeeper. Because some moms can make this easier for dad, and some moms can make it harder. Sometimes women or mothers will play this role of gatekeeper, meaning that you know, she won't let him do anything, or <laughs> this isn't exactly gatekeeper, but one of my favorite uh, stories when my fam when my daughter was born is that my mom is, you know, obviously all very excited, and my husband had to say to my mother, can I hold my baby now, right? In that sense, my mother was acting as gatekeeper, right? He, he, um, yeah, so like, well, let me show you how to change the diaper, or where she's always correcting how he does it. And that can make fathers feel very disenfranchised. It can make them feel very sad. Your textbook even suggests that dads may experience some postpartum. And it's good to have dad's involvement. It's good because you're, you're basically rearranging that whole, all of those relationships, right? Um, and then our culture also is changing what's expected of dads. Um, you know, back in the olden days, dads would stay outside the labor and delivery room and they would be told that a baby has been born. Today, dads are expected to be right there, right? Right there when that child is born. And he's expected to be involved and he's expected to know how to do things. And the only way he learns how to do things is the same way mom's learning how to do things. It's trial and error. Parental empowerment is a phenomenon or is a term given to when a couple or an individual feels like, hey man, I got this, right? And the reality is, is that when that first one happens, you don't feel that way. You know, you there's it's it's normal for, for somebody to think, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? How am I going to do this? But then you kind of get into your stride, right? You kind of get into the groove and you're like, I, I got this under control. I have memories of when my second kid was born, um, I felt very empowered. I was breastfeeding and I was sort of, I was doing it kind of a minimalist. I'd strap her on with my babushka. I didn't need bottles because I had a breast. I put a diaper in my back pocket and that was all I needed. And I felt very, very empowered. It was, it was fun, right? It was fun, which, you know, like we talk about in human growth is predicts or influence the relationship you'll have with that child. If your experience with that child makes you feel good about yourself, you're going to feel good about that child too. And then finally, the last item on this slide, and this is also a, an exam question, and that is the changes in marital stability and satisfaction. We have mentioned this before, but we must, but here it is again. How do children, um, how do they affect the odds of a couple getting divorced and the overall relationship satisfaction. Satisfaction goes down, 
right? I mean, that's just documented over and over again. People find that they are less happy in their marriage, but stability goes up. So the odds of divorce, or the other way around, the odds of divorce go down and marital satisfaction goes down. Or you could say marital satisfaction goes down and stability goes up. So I like to say that children are actually the ball and chain. That when children come, the couple is more likely to stay together. And as each child comes along, it reduces the odds that that couple will divorce and break up. I'm going to stop right here and pick up in the next slide.